Welcome, Welcome to your online coffee break, where we discuss bite-sized topics that inspire, educate, and entertain. Here's your host, a software innovator, award-winning marketer, and astronomy and space buff, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks for joining us today for your online coffee break. Today, I'd like to welcome to our show my special guest, Dr. Eugene Parker. Dr. Parker is a solar astrophysicist. In the mid-1950s, he developed the theory of the supersonic solar wind and predicted the Parker spiral shape of the solar magnetic field. Dr. Parker was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1967 and has received numerous awards and honors throughout his career. Most recently, he was awarded the Medal for Exceptional Achievement in Research by the American Physical Society for his fundamental contributions to space physics, plasma physics, solar physics, and astrophysics for over 60 years. In his honor, NASA renamed the Parker Solar Probe after him, the first time in history that a space vessel was named after a living person. Online Coffee Break Dr. Parker, I wanted to thank you for joining me today. Okay, well, it's a nice sunny day, so <laughs> it go well. It certainly is. Um, I am so excited about this upcoming launch. I just wanted to get right into it. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit. I, you've had an amazing career, and you've made a huge impact in what we currently know about the sun. May I ask, when did you first become interested in physics? I guess when I was a senior in high school. Really? I've always been, and still am, curious about how things work and why is and the wherefores of it. And uh, when I was in uh, my senior year in high school, I took the physics course. And uh, physics is uh, a little bit about everything, and I was delighted. And then I realized that you can earn your living in, in, in physics. I had a grandfather and an uncle who were physicists. And uh, I was thinking at that time about a vocation for my life, and obviously physics was it. So I took the physics course, was delighted, and never looked back. <laughs> wow, that's what I had no idea that it sort of ran in the family for you. That's very interesting. Well, sort of, yeah. You know, as I say, an, an uncle, and then uh, my father was an engineer. Hmm mechanical engineer, so I, I guess you can say it runs in the family, yeah. Now, Dr. Parker, it was in the mid-1950s where I believe you came up with the term solar wind. I was just wondering, in general, can you explain to our listeners what exactly is the solar wind? Well, the fact is that there's a wind blowing outward from the sun mm -hmm. in all directions, and uh, it sweeps out through the solar well, through the solar system, past the planets, and uh, past the poles of the sun too. It's in all directions, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the solar wind. It pushes everything out of the way until you're way, way out in the space, before it finally spreads out enough that the local gas can stop it. But uh, it. Extend the solar wind extends, uh, blows out a distance of more than a hundred times the distance of Earth from the Sun. Wow. Uh, the outer planets, let's see, Neptune is just shy of 30 times as far, <laughs> so it, it's three or four times as far as Neptune is from the Sun. Wow. And uh, let's see if we can translate this into light minutes. Uh, if you're at 30, that's eight minutes. Uh, light takes eight minutes to go uh, the dis distance from the Earth to the Sun, mm -hmm. called an astronomical unit, by the way. Right. And uh, eight times 30 is 240, and uh, 240 is four hours. If you're out at Neptune, it's you're four light hours away from the Sun, and uh, the solar wind goes much farther than that, clear out to something like 16, 18 hours. It's wow. not a definite figure because this, the solar wind is not entirely uniform and so forth. Sure. Uh, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft, which were launched more than 40 years ago, 
are now way, way out beyond that even, and uh, at about 100 astronomical units, that is times the Earth's sun distance, mm -hmm. uh, the wind goes through a shock front, and the solar wind is supersonic, I should add, mm -hmm. and at that distance it goes through a shock front and slows down to subsonic velocities. Oh, really? Uh, I did not realize that. And it, it it forms a huge region of space around the sun that travels along with the sun as the sun moves in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. now, and I, sh I should add, then, that you infer from this that since the sun is a very ordinary star and does all this, then this must be a very common phenomenon. And uh, almost every star, in fact, has a stellar wind of the same general magnitude. See, I think that's fascinating. Now, I, I don't know if you can answer this, but when you sort of came up with a theory on the solar wind, I understand it was like four lines of algebra. Can you tell us more about, you know, when did you come up with that theory? How did, how did that come about where you realized, huh, this is, this is the solar wind? Well, uh, this was back, as you mentioned, in the uh, early 50s, where... Mm -hmm. You didn't go out into space and measure things. There was no way of getting there. But uh, you inferred things from what you could see. And the magnetic field of Earth, which encloses Earth and keeps gases and things, uh, interplanetary gases, keeps them away from Earth. And, uh, well, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to think about the best way to put it in words. That's okay. I couldn't imagine. Yeah, yeah. We're we're in a cocoon made of our own magnetic field here on Earth, mm -hmm. and and the wind blows by outside this magnetic cocoon, but it rattles the magnetic field, shakes it a bit, and, it, and you can detect that at the surface of the Earth. And so, for a hundred years, people have been distantly hoping. They could understand why the magnetic field of Earth would shake at times. It was, but by 1950, it was clear that, in fact, by 1900, it would it become clear that the sun emits what they call solar corpuscular radiation. That's a name carefully chosen mm -hmm. not to commit you to anything until <laughs> you understand sure. it better. <laughs> and uh, uh, John Simpson was one of the people who there was a whole lot of people earlier who studied it, too. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I should... Well, my favorite ex early experiment was 1725. An English physician named Graham was interested in the slight rattling of the magnetic field, mm -hmm. and he devised an experiment which proved it, showed it directly. He suspended a magnetized needle, think of a knitting needle made of iron, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it, it suspended by a string uh, attached to the middle, and it'll swing around, and stop, once it stops swinging, it'll point in the direction of the local magnetic field. Mm -hmm. He set up this in his laboratory and very carefully observes it with a microscope, because these are not large effects. These are very small effects. Okay, and he can see the slight motion of the needle some days, and some days it was perfectly quiet. <laughs> and uh, from this he deduced that the magnetic field of Earth was, well, I'll say bombarded, whatever <laughs> word is appropriate, right. uh, at, uh, at times. A uh, Swede uh, named Celsius... Uh, a young man got into the business, and between the two of them, the, f the first thing they established was that it, this shaking of the field is worldwide. And uh, you can take it from there outside of the field. There must be something bumping into the field. And, uh, well, there's a long, interesting history as people did better and better experiments. And by 1950, it was clear that you stuff, uh, solar corpuscular radiation was emitted from the sun, particularly at times when there was activity on the sun, flares and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which they occasionally could see. And uh, it, 
John Simpson was interested in probing whatever it is that's in interplanetary space by looking at the variation of cosmic rays. Mm -hmm. Cosmic rays vary with time. Cosmic rays consist of particles traveling at nearly the speed of light. And uh, they, well, they do a lot of different variational forms recognized by various people. We could go, it'd be an interesting subject to go into. Mm -hmm. And uh, John was monitoring the cosmic rays. For instance, in February of 1956, there was a huge flare on the sun which emitted fast particles. Oh, sometimes called solar cosmic rays because they did travel at nearly the speed of light. Wow. And uh, from that work, uh, which was tracked by neutron, so-called neutron monitors on the ground, this mm -hmm. is just a name for a cosmic ray detector, okay. uh, it established that between the Earth and the Sun, there, there was very little, if any, blockage of cosmic rays, which means any magnetic fields in space must be more or less radial, centered on the sun, and uh, well, that was, that was a big recognition itself, because people argued about what was really in space. Mm -hmm. Is there electric fields, are there magnetic fields, and so forth, mm -hmm. and uh, he offered me a job as a, re a research associate, mm -hmm. and uh, to to take a look at these things, and that's what got me started on it. And here was upfront data of activity, and to make a long story short, uh, it soon became clear from the motion of, well, let, let me say that slightly differently. Mm -hmm. It had been recognized by other people, Biermann and Hofmeister and others, that Comet tails point away f away from the sun, in spite of the fact that you think that of a comet tail as trailing out behind the comet. Right. It, it isn't true. The, the, the tail points away from the sun. Something on the sun was blowing it away. Uh, first, they thought it was sunlight, but then calculations showed that wasn't strong enough. And uh, through the work of Biermann and others, mm -hmm. uh, they established that. It was particles from the sun, solar corpuscular radiation, blowing out from the sun in all directions, because comet tails never failed to point away from the sun, wherever the comet may be, whenever the comet may be coming by. And uh, if you think about that for a while, you realize it's a hydrodynamic flow, uh, like the flow of any other gas. Mm -hmm except this is out in space, and uh, it gives you a definite picture of hydrodynamics, uh, gas expanding away from the sun in all directions. So you write down the hydrodynamic equation for the outward motion, the radial motion of, of the solar corpuscular radiation, mm -hmm. and that has only one solution that properly fits the picture, and that's a super uh, acceleration to supersonic velocities uh, within a few solar radii of the sun, and, uh, well, uh, it, it's simply an outward blowing wind, and the obvious name, which took me a while to think of, uh, the, the obvious name is solar wind, and uh, there was great, almost universal skepticism because people normally thought of space as being empty or at least filled only with, with static gas. Right. But but you can't do it. The sun is at a the corona of the sun is at a million degrees and it, it's trapped by the gravitational field close to the sun, but when you get a little farther away from the sun, where the gravity is not as strong, it's perfectly free to escape into space, and that's the solar wind. It's up to speed before it even gets to the planet Mercury, which is a third the distance of, of uh, Earth from the sun. Right. 
throw in one long-winded sentence. That's what. It, <laughs> that's that is what okay. I, I I just find that fascinating. Now I know, Dr. Parker, one of the objectives of the Parker Solar Probe mission, named after you, is to determine why the corona, the atmosphere of the sun, is actually hotter than the surface. Can you explain right. that a little bit more? Excuse me. Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, the outer atmosphere of the sun, uh, starting not very far above the surface, mm -hmm. is at a million degrees. Now, your first thought is a million degrees, so it would be dazzling, it would be incredibly bright. Mm -hmm. But it's a very tenuous gas, and it does not emit much energy, not light. And uh, so it, it extends rather easily out through space, unable to cool in spite of its temperature because it's so tenuous. The atoms rarely bump into each other, and that's what bumping into each other is when they emit radiation. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can see the corona clearly during an eclipse of the sun. The moon covers up the sun, and the sky darkens, and there is the faint corona. And uh, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Have you have you witnessed solar eclipses? Excuse me. Have you been able to witness any solar eclipses like the one we had last year? Yes, I've been fortunate to see two. So it's quite an awesome phenomenon. It's perfectly straightforward and, and you've, you've seen pictures of the corona taken when the moon covers up the sun absolutely uh, but it's quite a it's still quite awesome when you stand there and watch it happen i agree uh, i agree my wife and i we saw one the last year was the first time i've ever seen one and it was just so beautiful and incredible what an amazing experience no, it's, it's over just in a few minutes, too. <laughs> it is true. I had, had the timer on, so I, I spent half the one minute I had, or one minute taking pictures and the other minute just looking up and enjoying the experience. Yeah, the uh, temperature has been measured with reliability. At, at a, well, it varies. So over the corona, one or two million degrees is a good rule of thumb. Wow. That's... That, that's been uh, measured, the temperature has been measured in several different ways, so there's no question about it. And that's why the outer uh, the corona extends far out from the sun into space, and the outer parts are far enough from the sun that solar gravity cannot hold them in, so they escape. And again, you think, well, gee, that must take a lot of energy. Right. No, this is this is really very tenuous stuff. Huh. At the orbit of Earth, the density of the corona is typically five per cubic centimeter. A cube the size of your fingernail contains about five atoms on average. It varies, of course, with time. But that's such a tenuous medium, it doesn't cool. And it, uh, the heat is transmitted out through the, well, with the electrons mostly, but mm -hmm. uh, extended out, far out through space. So even at the orbit of Earth, the temperature of the corona may be a few hundred thousand degrees. Wow. And that's what propels it on its merry little way out into space. And the sun carries this wind with it and produces, as we mentioned earlier, this huge cell in space. And, uh, well, uh, we, it, the solar wind is a common to all ordinary stars like the sun. Wow. Uh, Dr. Parker, if I may, um, last year NASA renamed uh, the spacecraft, the Parker Solar Probe, after you. What was it like to have a spacecraft named after you on this important mission? Well, <laughs> it's it meant that I've been involved in a, in a number of interviews. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Thank you for this. We do appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you ha do you have any involvement with the actual P Parker Solar Probe mission itself? No, I have done nothing but being a, an enthusiastic spectator. <laughs> well, that's uh, okay, too. I admire the guys that are making it work. Uh, that's uh, that's where the credit goes for that spacecraft. 
uh, as you know, there's been some delays in launching Yes. For, because of minor problems, I've got my fingers crossed that they'll get everything under control in time. I uh, hope the, they will. I hope they will. Um, do you? I, I believe you're going to go to the launch, hopefully? I'm going to get a chance to see the launch, yeah. I've never seen a rocket launch before. Really? And well, I think you're going to like it. We're, I, I'm actually going to be down there, too. Um, so we're, we just cannot wait. Uh, I wish it'd stop getting rescheduled, but we're really looking forward to that. I think you're, you're oh. in for quite a joy to see that rocket lift off the pad. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to it with my fingers crossed. <laughs> the, the, the deadline, the, the restriction on launch dates is because they intend to move the spacecraft in toward the sun by having it swing by moving planets, Venus in particular. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you do it, if you come by the backside of a moving planet, it swings the spacecraft around and actually slows it down relative to the sun because the Mm -hmm. rocket fuel to do it by brute force is prohibitive. They're going to make the planets do this. Uh, that's been, that was a trick for getting the Mariner spacecraft out. That uh, right. excuse me, the Voyager spacecraft out. Right. And this is going to take a spacecraft in. You just reverse the process. I think that's fascinating. Is there anything you're particularly looking forward to to learning from the results of the solar probe mission? Yeah, it's going to perform a number of tasks of interesting phenomena. I mentioned casually that the wind is not constant, it fluctuates. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it fluctuates when there's a big blast of energy. So it fluctuates very much. And uh, one of the the interesting, most interesting things will be to see the structure of the wind at the time a blast wave goes by. Uh, You can calculate what kind of thing you might well see but the details you'll never know until you observe it. Right. And, well, the other thing is, what can we learn about heating the corona? Remember the million degrees that play such an essential role. Yes. And people have pointed out that you probably have some f- form of wave motion which is dissipated by friction, hmm. and its heat goes into this very tenuous corona, Uh, And because of the low density, it doesn't take much. It boosts the temperature to a million degrees. And it would be nice to dip a spacecraft into that and see really in detail how that works. Oh, that's going to be so exciting. Uh, Dr. Parker, I can't thank you enough just for all the uh, discoveries and and, and theories that you've uh, successfully done about the sun for uh, your entire career and we're just so excited about the launch and really do appreciate you just taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today thank you so much well it's a pleasure talking to you online coffee break wow what an honor it was today to speak with uh, dr parker he is 91 years old and has been just truly revolutionary for just the study of the sun it's amazing to actually talk to the person who came up with the solar wind uh, term and all his theories. Uh, I just admire his persistence. When he first came out with the theory, there were a few skeptics, uh, but his theory was proven, as a matter of fact, just within a couple years later by actual satellite data. It's exciting about this mission being named after him. Again, the first time a NASA mission has ever been named after a living person. I want to thank him for joining us today. I want to thank you, our listeners, for listening today and for watching today. Uh, if you'd like to comment on today's topic or subscribe to our series, you can visit us at onlinecoffeebreak.com or find us at facebook.com forward slash online coffee break. Uh, you can also follow us at instagram.com forward slash online coffee break um, or give us a call at 317 862 4700. You can leave your comment there and we might just share it on the air. Uh, be sure to rate us on iTunes or share this episode with your friends. Thanks again for listening today. See you next time. God bless.